Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. May I have your attention, please? May I have your attention, please? Thank you. We're going to be starting in the next three or four minutes. So I just wanted to alert you to that, give you a chance to settle down so that we can begin on time. So thank you very much. We'll be starting in a moment. All family members should be at the back of the church at this point. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. We would like to welcome everyone to the celebration of John Hooper's life. We will start with tolling the bells eight times, one time each for the decades of John's life.
394 in Breaking Bread, 643 in Lead Me, Guide Me. Please stand. Thank you. 
be seated. With you all. Please be seated for the reading of the obituary and Jesus welcome statement. Mary Hooper Irwin. Thank you for everyone being here and celebrating John's life. Look at all the people that he's touched with his kindness and his love. John Stanley Hooper was born January 21st, 1938. He was the eldest of three sons born to John and Kathleen Fitzgerald Hooper in Boston, Massachusetts. When he was six months old, his dad was transferred to Michigan by the railroad company and the family moved to Michigan. His family lived in Wyandotte, then Lincoln Park, towns downriver from Detroit. From the ninth grade, John began attending the Sacred Heart Seminary in Detroit, Michigan, where he graduated both high school and college, and of course was valedictorian for both classes. He then attended North American College in Rome, Italy, and on December 18, 1963, was ordained to be a Catholic priest in Rome. Upon his return to Detroit, John was a priest for the Archdiocese of Detroit, was assigned as an associate pastor at St. Pascal Parish in Taylor, Michigan, where he served for a few years. John also taught at Cardinal Mooney High School, thank you, which was the high school at Sacred Heart Seminary. In 1969, John was assigned to the vicar of Parish's office where he ministered for five years. During the early 1970s, John was the priest member of the Onawim small faith community in Gross Point. In 1974, John chose to take his pastoral ministry in another direction. Okay, we hear you. <laughs> he did community organizing with Pontiac Ecumenical Ministry where he continued to work through much of the 1980s. In 1988, John co-founded the McGee Loan Fund for Episcopal Diocese of Michigan, served as its first executive director until his retirement in the early 2000s. The fund accepted donations from individuals and groups and made loans to small businesses not eligible for loans from banks. John was also very active in the Episcopal Network of Economic Justice. As one of his colleagues put it, John was a historian and an intellectual voice in the Episcopal Network for Economical Justice. He is the hero of economical, economic justice. Following retirement in 2003, John continued his social justice activism and ministry, co-founding Catholics for the Common Good, as well as Gloryland Housing Committee at the Jesu Church in Detroit. He also co-authored Jesu's Welcome Statement and was very active in Jesu's Peace and Justice Committee. John, of course, was a family man. In 1975, he married Patricia Harrington, and at John's passing, they were married for nearly 47 years. Wow. In these early years, they lived in Pontiac, Michigan, where they raised their child, Marty. Um, in, in 1988, 1998, they moved to the University District in Detroit, Michigan, where he lived for the remaining 24 years of his life. As we all know, John was a kind and gentle man and very active in the communities where he lived and the parishes he attended. He continued to be pastoral, officiating at wakes, weddings for family and friends, and acting as a spiritual counselor to many. John passed peacefully on March 24th, 2022, after living several years with dementia. John is survived by his wife, Patricia Harrington, his son, Martin, or Marty Hooper, with his wife, Jenny Pardini, and granddaughter, Chloe, or Cece Hooper. Uh, his brother, Gilbert, Gil, married to Danielle. His niece is Michelle Hooper, married to Andy Hignite, and Mary Irwin, me, and my husband, Jason. Sister-in-law, Kathy Hooper, and the late Thomas, my father, Tom Hooper. Um, and in-laws, Mary Margaret Bellon, with the late Marcel Bellon, Kathleen Nolan, and Jack Harrington. Ann Harrington, as well as many nieces and nephews. And then, of course, the family appreciates everyone being here. And um, in lieu of any flowers or gifts, please, um, there's a place that's really special to Patricia and to the family um, called the Hannon Center. Uh, there was a daybreak program that he participated in. Um, it was just so impactful to, to us and to John. During the last nine months of his life, he participated in this day program um, designed specifically for people living with uh, dementia. The staff and other participants loved him. 
He made many great friends there, and I heard he had lots of uh, theological discussions as well. Um, so we thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Jesus' welcoming statement, as you have just heard, which was partially authored by John, will now be read by Rosa Tonetti. You are welcome. Just as Jesus welcomed all who came to him, Jesu Parish welcomes every person to seek full participation in our parish community and within the body of Christ. We believe that all are worthy of respect and love because all are created in the image of God. Our welcome is not limited by a person's age, sex, race, cultural background, physical or mental health or ability, sexual orientation or gender identity, social or economic situation, marital status, or faith background. We do not seek to erase our differences. Rather, we lovingly embrace the rich and unique dimensions within each of us as we strive to grow together in holiness. This is the wholeness of life moving with as much understanding, compassion, and humility as we can, we journey together in a safe, positive, and nurturing environment beyond tolerance toward mutual respect in grateful celebration of God's creation. As a visitor, uh, and I think many of you are too, I feel very welcome, and I hope you all do too, as we celebrate John's life. Let us pray. Oh God, we love our brother John. He is now beyond the sight of our eyes, the touch of our hands. We are grateful that you blessed us with his presence for a time, and we confidently pray that you will now give him your loving presence for all time. The love that we have for John is just a shadow of the love that you have for him. And so we pray confidently today that you will welcome him into your perfect love. And we ask that you give us the inspiration and the inner strength we need to carry on until that day when we are joined with him in your glory. We ask all this through Jesus, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to be seated to listen to the scriptures. The first reading will be by Bill Hickey, followed by the gospel read by Father Lumpkin. This is a reading from the letter to Philippians. Uh, it's a reading that isn't often read at funerals or memorial services. So Pat asked me just to say a word about why she chose it. It is said that Philippians was the only community that Paul would accept gifts from. We don't know why this was the case, but there was obviously a very loving, close bond between Paul and the community. Similarly, John and Pat, over the long course of John's illness, accepted gifts from their own special community. It's all of us here 
in this building and beyond. Gifts like um, a phone call, some respite care, transportation, sharing a meal. The list is long. And truth told, Pat and John didn't just accept those gifts by the um, by the other transparency of the, uh, with which they talked about John's uh, dementia, with the generosity of their humility, with the honesty with which they made their needs known, they called out gifts from all of us. Maybe sometimes gifts we didn't even know we had to give. And as some have reminded us during this week, that actually formed our community. And that in itself is a gift. So this reading, in this reading, Paul is saying thanks to his gift-giving Philippians. And as I read it, Pat would like us not only to hear the voice of Paul, but to hear her voice and John's as well. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. The word of God. They are happy whose strength is in you. 
in whose heart are the roads to Zion. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside, and after he sat down and the disciples gathered around, Jesus began to teach them. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. The kingdom of God is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn, they will be consoled. Blessed are those who are lowly, they will inherit the land. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice, they will have their fill. Blessed are those who show mercy to others, they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the single-hearted, they will see God. Blessed are those who work for peace, they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of their struggle for justice. The kingdom of God is there. The Gospel of the Lord. Lord Bill did a wonderful job of helping us to hear that first reading that was selected for today as a living word spoken to us here and now today. And I'm, so I'm just going to focus my own reflections on the gospel. And hopefully it'll be a living word too for you. When I first heard these words, we commonly call them the Beatitudes. And for many years after that, I tended to understand Jesus talking about a blessing or a happiness that would come in the next life that if you had had a tough life on this earth, if it had been a tough go for you, God would make it up for you after your death, would give you that you'd be blessed and happy because you had such a rough go during your earthly days. But over the years, I've come to appreciate that what Jesus is describing as making for happiness and blessedness is a happiness and a blessedness that we can experience now also. 
that if we follow this way that Jesus is describing, that we can know a blessedness and a happiness in this life as well. And this can really be hard to get uh, growing and living as we do in our culture. I think you could take each one of these Beatitudes and try to say, what would be the exact opposite of this? And that would be what our culture says makes for blessedness and happiness. And so, you know, Jesus says, the blessed are those who are poor in spirit. The opposite of that would be rich in material things. And isn't that what the culture says makes for happiness? <laughs> no. Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn. I think the culture would say the opposite of that. Blessed are those who don't have any pain, any sorrow. Think of all the commercials for pain relievers every night you hear. <laughs> you know. Jesus says, blessed are those who are lowly. Oh, no, indeed. Blessed are those who are number one. <laughs> That's who's blessed. Blessed are those who dominate. That's who's blessed, not who are lowly. No. Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice. I think the opposite of that would be, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for self-gratification. And along with that, blessed are the single-hearted, that who the culture is sort of single-hearted in telling us that what life is all about is about you getting yours. It isn't about working for justice for everybody. It's all about you getting gratified. Again, just think of all the commercials, and they get inside you, you know. You deserve a break today. We do it all for you. <laughs> you deserve this mattress. I mean, over and over again, you get that message that life is about you and you getting yours. You know. and blessed are those who work for peace. Blessed are those who are armed to the teeth. That's the blessed ones in this world, according to our culture. Blessed are those who show mercy. Oh, no. The really blessed ones are the ones who don't let anybody take advantage of them. You can't do that. You've got to be on your guard always. And then blessed are those who are persecuted because of their struggle for justice. I guess the opposite of that would be blessed are those who aspire to celebrity status, to be admired and respected, to be in the news, on the TV, stuff like that. That's what will make for happiness. You know? But that's just simply to say that the culture conditions us to think that this is kind of a crazy way to live. To be poor in spirit, to mourn, to be lowly, show mercy, be a peacemaker. And one of the things I think God does for us, Christ does for us, is that he not only has taught us with words that this is what can make for a blessed and happy life, but he sends into our life people who show that it works. <laughs> that you can live this kind of life that he's describing and, and know happiness in this life. And that would be the context in which I would offer John. Yeah. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who don't think they have it all, who think they're self-sufficient and don't need anybody. That's what the culture will say. John knew he needed people to be happy. He knew he needed Pat. He knew he needed a, a child, Marty a grandchild, you know. He knew he needed a lot of you. He was poor in spirit in that way. He didn't think he had it all. <laughs> he didn't need anybody. 
He didn't think that way at all, and you know he didn't. He knew he needed others. In that sense, he was poor in spirit. He couldn't be happy if left to just himself. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed is the person who, when somebody else is having a difficult time, going through a stressful day, can emphasize, can get into their heart, can get into their skin, and feel something of their pain himself. I think that was John. Yeah. He would do, if he would you know, meet somebody who was having a tough, tough day or a tough time, he would show compassion and try to do what he could to alleviate or eliminate the distress. Blessed are those who are lowly. John didn't try to dominate. John tried to serve. The best example I heard recently was Pat one day was saying that when John went to the daycare center at Hannon House, uh, in which he was one of a number of adults with dementia, that they just loved him there, the, the, other, the other people at the daycare center and the staff, because he would put himself in the service of them. He would figure out things for them to do, things that they would have fun doing. He didn't think himself over and above them. <laughs> he served them. Blessed are the lowly. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice. And I'm going to include that. Blessed are the single-hearted. In the obituary that was read, all the different things that John did with his life. I mean, he lived to try to make the world more equitable, to do his own small part, try to combat racial injustice, economic injustice, He lived to, it was his life. We might say from a scripture point of view, he lived to make God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. He didn't just live for himself and what he could get out of life himself. Blessed are those who show mercy. I've seen John at times, uh, relate to people who I would have said were difficult people to be around, hard to be with. And he could be very understanding of their limitations and their failings. He could be very merciful and, and take them seriously and not get impatient. But for those who work for peace, and blessed are those who are persecuted because of their struggle for justice. I checked with Pat right before, and John and Pat were arrested one time in their life. <laughs> I don't know if you want to call that persecution, but, <laughs> but uh, um, he, he, um, his whole life was really about trying to make life happier for others. Yeah. So I guess all I want to say is I want to celebrate, we're invited to celebrate John who was a witness that Jesus' teaching about what makes for happiness and blessedness in life works. John was a happy person. And he lived that way that Jesus taught makes for happiness. And so when we live in a culture which can seem so crazily the opposite of those teaching, it's good for us to see, actually see somebody who lives this way and is happy. We need to see that it works if, before we try to do it ourselves. <laughs> you know? And many of you do it too. But I think we do need to see one another who 
that we're happy in living this way, which is so contrary to the way of our culture. Well, that's the main thing I wanted to say. Just one other thing. I think it's fitting that we're celebrating John's life in the context of Eucharist, not simply because John valued worship, Eucharist himself so much, but when we celebrate Eucharist, we, we celebrate our belief that Christ is really present to us in the Eucharist. Even though we can't see him with our eyes or touch him with our hands, hear him with our ears, that he's present. And every Eucharist is for us, or can be for us, a reminder that real presence isn't essentially being able to see somebody with your eyes or touch them with your hands or hear them with your ears. You can be in a crowded room with a hundred people and not really be present to any of them. Who you're really present to is the person who lives at home with you and wants you to stop and pick up something on the way back. You know, real presence is essentially a communion of the heart. You know, those are the people who are really present. And so, while we can be sad today that we can no longer see John with our eyes or hear him with our ears, or, or at least not for a while, or touch him with our hands, give him a hug, it doesn't mean he can't really be present to you. In some way or another, all of us, to more or less degree, he's in us. He's with us. We can be sad that we can't see him with our eyes anymore or touch him with our hands or stuff like that, but we shouldn't be sad that he isn't with us. Because every Eucharist reminds us that real presence is essentially a communion of the heart. Amen. And now, just before Michelle Hooper reads the offertory petitions, I'd like to note that although it is not in our programs, the gospel was read by Father Robert Scully. Michelle? For John, in thanksgiving for his kind and gentle ways as partner, father, brother, uncle, and friend. For the Hooper and Harrington families, especially those who have gone before us, Jack and Kathleen Hooper, Tom Hooper, Patrick and Loretta Harrington, and Marcel Balland, we pray to the Lord. For all those living with dementia and for their caregivers, for the staff at Daybreak and the Hannon Center in Detroit for their kindness and care of John over the last nine months of his life, for the Accents Hospice community and John's caregivers in his last days, Carolyn, Kim, Bobby, Tamika, and Tierra, that they will continue to be blessed in the important work that they provide. We pray to the Lord. In gratitude for the JZU community, the UDCA neighborhood community, and all of our family and friends for the abundance of care and love they've shared with John and Patricia over the last several years, we pray to the Lord. For Tom Hinsberg, a dear longtime friend to many of us here who passed last evening, and for his wife, Connie Soma, that she may find peace and comfort in her grieving. May the life work of Tom Hinsberg and John Hooper inspire us as we continue to strive for justice and peace. We pray to the Lord. Spirit of God, John heard your call to share in building up the kingdom of God 
inflame our passion for justice into a commitment to address unjust situations and structures, especially here in the city of Detroit. We pray to the Lord. God of peace, who light dispels the darkest night, we pray for the people of Ukraine at this time of warfare and violence. We pray to the Lord. So we bring all these people and all these concerns to you, O God. We pray trustfully through Jesus, whom you've given to us as a light in our darkness, who lives with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. This will come up. John was a great man for bringing people together to talk about making the world a better place. Over his lifetime, he co-founded and worked on many programs. Today, Joe Heafy and Rosemary Lucas represent the hundreds of people with whom John worked to bring about change. A stack of files representing those committees will be presented by his grandniece, Abby. John also had a fond love for his family. Grandnephew Josh will present a photo of the Hooper family taken at his 80th birthday celebration. The chalice being presented was a gift to John from his family at the time of his ordination. It will be used at today's Mass. John frequently wore a hat and very often left them behind. <laughs> Many hats were left at Jesu over the years. Granddaughter Chloe will present and leave behind John's hat one last time. And during the offertory, Kieran and Mira Vinokobal, I did it anyway. Um, help me. Venikopal will play Wind by David uh, Brian Craig. Okay.
Sisters and brothers, let us pray that our offering may be acceptable to Almighty God. Amen. And so we bring, O oh God, these offerings of bread and wine. We bring as well the offering of John's life. We bring the offering of our own hearts today. And as we do, we pray that your Holy Spirit may fill them all, the bread, the wine, John, our hearts, our lives, with the presence ever deepening of Christ Jesus, who lives as well with you in the unity of your spirit now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Amen. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Amen. All powerful and ever living God, we do well always and everywhere to give you thanks through Jesus Christ. In him who rose from the dead, our hope of resurrection has dawned. For your faithful people, life is changed, not ended. And the abode of this earthly dwelling being dissolved, an eternal dwelling is prepared in heaven. And so we join this day with sisters and brothers throughout the earth. We join with the angels and saints in heaven. We join with all your creation. And it's an ending praise of you as we sing. sit as is your custom. O oh God, it is you who are the Holy One, the very fountain of holiness. And so we pray that your Holy Spirit may come upon these gifts so that they may become for us the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Before Jesus was given up to death, a death he freely accepted, he took bread. Giving you thanks and praise, he broke the bread, gave it to the disciples and said, take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which will be given up for you. And then when supper was ended, he took the cup. Again, giving you thanks, he gave the cup to the disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of a new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you and for all that sins may be forgiven. And do this in memory of me. The Mystery of Faith. It is then in memory of Jesus' death and resurrection that we offer you this life-giving bread, this saving cup, thanking you for counting us worthy to be in your presence and to serve you. May all of us who share in the body of the Lord be brought together in the unity of the Holy Spirit. Lord, remember your church throughout the world. Help us to grow in love with our Pope Francis, our Bishop Alan, and with all your children everywhere. Remember John, 
In baptism, he died. May he not And with all the mercy on us, make us worthy to share eternal life with Mary, the Virgin Mother, Joseph, the Apostles, and all the saints who have done your will throughout the ages. May we praise you in union with them and give you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, almighty God, forever and ever. stand. <laughs> and now, sister, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will as we forgive those who trespass against us. But deliver us from evil. Deliver us, we beg you, from every evil. In your mercy, give us free from sin, and protect us from all anxieties, as we wait with joyful hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, where and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord, you say to us, I leave you peace. Peace is my gift to you. Look then not on our sin, but upon our faith, and give to us the peace and the unity of your kingdom where you live forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you all always. Peace. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, as we have a large number of folks here today, please follow the directions of the ushers uh, when you come up for communion. Thank you.
This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Happy are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Union hymn is number 342 in Breaking Bread. Number 342 in Breaking Bread.
Candle on the Water will be played by Joe Chung, the grandniece of John and Patricia. Joe? John's brother, Gil, will say some words about John. What a group. Beautiful, beautiful people. Thank you for coming today. My name is uh, Gilbert Hooper. I'm uh, John's uh, younger brother. John Stanley Hooper. He's a son, a brother, a husband, father, grandfather, and a great lifelong friend. 
Many of you knew him as a priest or later as a family man and a constant advocate of social justice. He touched a lot of lives in Detroit and we, we really miss him. I am the, uh, the youngest and the last of the three Detroit Hooper brothers. Tom was our middle brother and he passed at a very early age of 56. I was the youngest and John and I were nine years apart. I always looked up to him as my big brother and my guide and he never let me down. When we were growing up, we knew him as Stan. It was never explained to me exactly why we did that except my father's name was John Stanley Hooper also, but everybody called him Jack. <laughs> anyway, the Hooper nephews and nieces and others still call him Stan. And it wasn't until his later seminary days that Stan went away and John became his priestly name. You heard earlier, but um, at a very young age, John decided to become a, a priest and he wanted to go to the seminary and actually moved, moved to the seminary right after eighth grade. He was 13 going on 14 and I was four years old. I was uh, young and really did not get why he had to live away from home and actually until I visited him at the seminary. Sacred Heart Seminary, every type of sport imaginable, no parents around and freedom to be yourself. <laughs> that really looked great to me and I tried it unsuccessfully, but that's a story for another day. John was a very serious student and did well through high school and college and graduated as a class valedictorian. At that point, the diocese sent him to Rome to study for several more years. It was a huge thrill when our family finally traveled to Rome for his ordination. We were all proud of my brother, but no more than my mother. My father and her owned a small motel in Flat Rock, and she was the talker of the family. She greeted the guests and spent time talking with them and just about everything that came into her mind. Tom and I used to listen in and make bets to see just how long it would take her to get around to mentioning my son, the priest. <laughs> As a proud Irish mother, there was nothing better than to have a son in the priesthood. John's career as a priest was extremely rewarding for him and everyone he came in contact with. Having various assignments throughout the diocese, including a stint as, as a uh, teacher at Sacred Heart Seminary, he earned his way into the diocese office. We saw this as a stepping stone to a promotion, and in actuality it turned out that way, but in a very different sense. At the diocese, he met a, a, a young Pat Harrington, who is a young Irish lass, and a nun. Well, as you know, a relationship blossomed, and they both decided to leave for the next chapter in their lives. John and Pat married and had a little boy named Martin, Marty, after Dr. Martin Luther King. John's priestly vocation evolved from the confines of the church to a broader flock, a broader flock who, who could use his knowledge, drive, and organizational skills to assist those who just needed a little something to do better in life. In fact, he got involved with the Episcopal Church and assisted in the formation of a credit union whose goal was to lend money to people that had a dream but lacked the resources to realize it. All this time they were raising Marty. Marty and John were very close. Marty went to college at Loyola, Loyola of Chicago and after graduation traveled the world teaching the English language. In fact, Marty was working in Cuba at one point and met a beautiful young girl named Jenny. They were eventually married and emigrated to Dublin since at that time U.S. visas were not readily available to Cubans and, and since Marty was an Irish citizen, Ireland was an obvious second choice. They now have a beautiful five-year-old daughter named Chloe and live in the Boston area. Chloe, pay attention. <laughs> Speaking of Marty, I'd like to introduce Dr. Martin Hooper, with, who will offer a, a different perspective on the life of his dad. Thank you.
I'm not sure how this will go if I can get through it. So we'll start with it. We'll start there. And following Uncle Gil is not never easy. But uh, first, on behalf of the family, I'd like to welcome you here today, um, and thank you for coming to support and celebrate support the family and celebrate my father's life. Um, as I think was mentioned uh, num numerous times already today, but I'll mention it again, um, my dad was a kind, spiritual man who really did see himself as a servant of God. He had an unconditional love and benevolence. Um, and I think in, I've I had enough Catholic school over the years that they, I think it's called ag uh, agape which is the biblical word for this unconditional love in Greece, in Greek. Um, basically a love in which you never ask for anything in return. And he followed that up with this dedication for the impoverished and disadvantaged. And this led him for this social justice work that has been described already. He saw inequity as a structural issue of power imbalance and making the world more just as his vocation. He practices ministry, um, and as, as was mentioned a few times, so that he could build the kingdom of God here, not just wait for it in the afterlife. With a father like this, you can imagine my, my childhood experiences were a little different than, than many. Um, so he, was a, he, he defined himself as a community organizer, which until Barack Obama came around, nobody even knew what that was. Um, so, um, and in the eight, in the 1980s, and I'm going to take people back because, uh, well, I, I lived, I grew up in Pontiac before they moved to Detroit, where a lot of people here have got, gotten to know him. Um, and so he would take me to protests um, for nuclear disarmament around the Cold War. So, so there's pictures of me holding his hand at protests. He regularly gave rides to homeless and to to people in halfway houses. He knew he knew them all, and we we would just they would get in the car and we would drive around the city. Um, and uh, and he was working with Ed Rowe, who's here, I think, yeah, um, canvassing around uh, Detroit community, uh, Pontiac community organizing at that time. Um, and one of the big one of the big victories was around Pontiac General Hospital, where the group didn't want the hospital to leave, to leave the town of Pontiac. And I looked it up, 40 days later, uh, 40 years later, it's still, in, it's still in Pontiac, so they won that battle. I appreciate the applause, it gives me a second to catch my breath. Um, his social justice work continued through his life, founding the McGee Fund and being active in social issues in this church, as many of you know. But I want to talk about him at home, where he was a kind, gentle, <laughs> and loving as he was at work. Um, in the 1980s, he chose to be a stay-at-home dad, work remotely and part-time. Um, he was our house's cook. He was the first one to get on his knees and clean the bathroom floor. And this was the 80s, so this was a long time ago. When it came to me, he was the best father ever. <laughs> and he made every sacrifice to ensure I had a great childhood. One area that I like to focus on is education, where he, he always made sure that I went to, to great schools, um, starting with Academy of the Sacred Heart and ending up here in high school at U of D High School. This often meant long commutes and a big chunk of the budget going to my education. Um, a famous story I wanted to share, um, I guess my mom hasn't heard this yet, so we'll figure out if it's true afterwards, but this is how I understood it. We got uh, Sacred Heart, at Sacred Heart it's pretty expensive, so they, they, they filled out some papers for financial aid one year, and the papers came back the economic assessment came back, and this is when he was work, working full time before he got to the McGee Fund. And it said, not only does it, do they not have money to fund full tuition, but they, the, the school will have to pay them money so they can make it. And uh, they made it, and I stayed there and finished up as uh, boys do in fourth grade, at least at that time. Um, 
With a child of my own, I often think of the dilemmas of parenting. Um, our daughter is really into princesses, no matter, no matter how much we haven't necessarily encouraged it. Um, but that's, that's kids these days. Uh, and I was really into uh, wrestling. And seven, when I was seven or eight, it would have been seven, eight, nine, um, the WWF was really popular, which is the World Wrestling Federation. It was one, it was one thing I went back and forth between the kids in Pontiac who I hung out with and the kids at Bloomfield Hills who I hung out with. Um, but it was the one thing that everybody had in common at that age, which we all loved wrestling. And there was this big event, WrestleMania, coming to the Pontiac Silver Dome. Um, biggest sporting event ever, a lot of hype. And uh, he must have hated every second of it. <laughs> um, he, like, there's numerous, there's so many ways in which he probably is against wrestling. But uh, sure enough, he made it happen. He brought me to WrestleMania 3, and it made me very happy at that age. Uh, another story that I would, uh, so I grew up a sports fan. My dad likes sports, and if he were here today, I'm sure he would, he would also tell you that he likes sports. Um, but you know, he, he dedicated himself to, to much higher goals, and he was always very busy. So, um, but even despite that, so he never really got, he often didn't get around to watching games unless he was with me. But he would always prioritize watching sports with me, and that was always very nice, um, because I'm an avid sports fan. When there were no t-ball teams in the, um, in, in, I wanted, really wanted to play t-ball, and there were no t-ball teams in the Pontiac Rec League because there was a scarcity of coaches, he stepped up and he became a t-ball coach. And he was my t-ball coach for a few years until I moved into what, whatever the next, when they started throwing the ball at us, the, the, the hard pitch. Uh, and uh, an interesting part of that is I remember him going through this, this notebook like of possible players and he was picking the t-ball team and in Pontiac at that time there were white teams and there were black teams and there were Hispanic teams and there were boys teams and there were girls teams but my dad went through and he created he picked people from different parts of the city from different cultures to create a, a diverse team so well this is Pontiac in the 80s and so while the other teams won more games <laughs> and uh, we didn't win many we were definitely the most diverse team uh, of, of, of all the t-ball teams in Pontiac. Uh, skipping ahead, skipping ahead, I, I'm just going to finish up here. Um, I, I always hear the story of, and I've heard, I heard this for a long time, about saving for retirement um, and saving for what might be the, 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 my parents' future. Um, and my dad was always like, God has a plan and will provide. <laughs> And he said this jokingly, and I think it made my mom a little bit nervous because she's more pragmatic. Um, but through his unconditional love, he was able to make great friends who had this similar kind of agape love um, and spirit. And this came full circle in the last few years of his life where my mom and many of his friends cared for him unconditionally from this terrible cognitive disease. The support was truly amazing, and I'm very grateful. And I always ask, why were we so lucky? Was it karma? Did he pay it forward? Good luck? Was it God's providence? What did he know that we didn't? Is that I always ask myself. In closing, my dad had a long, happy, impactful life. He also led many funerals and family and friends and wake services often helping the grieving and talking about loss. But he was very avid that funerals were a celebration of life. So if he were here today, he would say, be happy and don't follow my example up here. <laughs> but be happy and celebrate, celebrate today, celebrate his life and think wedding. So don't think funeral when you're at, well, think about where you're, how you're supposed to act today, think wedding because that's how you want it to be. But I, I, I realize I'm the last one on the program, and I don't think he'd want me to end there, because as much as he's probably like party on, he's probably also like, we need a message to end this, we need a to-do list. So my dad was always the activist. Um, and so I think, I think instead of party on, which I hope everybody does today, I think he would, he would say, in some modest way, that was less direct than I'm saying now, that 
that he would probably challenge us to continue to make the world a better place <laughs> and remind us that he shouldn't that we shouldn't celebrate him on a pedestal but we can also be benevolent we can also have agape and we can be instruments of change thank you Mary Paul and Carolyn Paul will now sing Be Thou My Vision, an old Irish hymn. Brother Jeff is going to uh, pray the final, we call the final commendation by the cremain. In the Catholic tradition, there are an abundance of different symbols, oftentimes joked around about as the smells and bells, all of these different elements. And sometimes they can seem much more than what we need. Sometimes, however, I think they offer us something really helpful. In just a moment, I will incense John's remains. We'll take this fragrant smoke and offer it as a blessing upon this one whom this community has loved. And what you will notice is for moments as that smoke rises, you'll be able to see it. 
But there will be other times that you will not. And then the sun will cut through it or the light will hit it and you'll see it again. It's a perfect symbol for the mystery that we are embracing now. For John, who has been loved by this community, by this family, is not here with us in the same way, but is here and will remain with us and with this community in a way that is more mysterious. And so let us enter into that mystery. Let us embrace that we won't always fully understand, but there is a reality, a truth, and a goodness to the John that will always remain and will be connected with loved ones in the time to come. Let's go get some incense. <laughs> oh. Carl, do you want to play in Paradisium? So let us pray. Into your hands, Father of mercies, we commend our brother John, in the sure and certain hope that together with all who have died in Christ, he will rise with him on the last day. We give you thanks for the blessings which you bestowed upon John in this life. They are signs to us of your goodness and of our fellowship with the saints in Christ. Merciful Lord, turn toward us and listen to our prayers. Open the gates of paradise to your servant and help us who remain to comfort one another with assurances of faith until we all meet in Christ and are with you and with our brother forever. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our celebration is ended. Let us go in peace. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Here, and you know Father Bob Scullin, he was introduced, and Father Jeff Dorr was present here. This is Father and friend, and, and Father Tom Sup. And there's uh, over here on the corner here, <laughs> Ed, Ed Proust. So we, we're glad all of you could come and join us too. And you're going to say, okay, we're ready.
Well, first of all, I'd like to thank Pat for allowing me to be part of this beautiful, beautiful celebration. The Harrington Hooper family thanks all of you for spending part of your weekend with them this afternoon and invites you to a repast in the Jesu School Social Hall. It's across the parking lot, just, in the, uh, just across the parking lot outside. We've already had uh, the Paradisum sung, and so now our recessional hymn will be On Eagle's Wings. Number 437 in Breaking Bread. <laughs> 